It's the underdogs back with you. I'm Jordan Brenner, joined as always by my co-host, the smartest man in all of sports, Peter Keating. Peter, how are you on this fine Wednesday morning? Jordan, how's it going? Jordan, I suspect you were one of the very few kids who liked going back to school. Were you? Is fall like your no. favorite season? No, I'm still, I actually still have back to school blues. Like on Sunday nights, I don't like Labor Day weekend. I'm uncomfortable when my kids go back to school. I'm feeling the, more bummed than they are. I, I I did not like the start of the school year at all. Well, I asked you that because I was projecting. I was one of the very few geeks in the world. I love going back to school. I love this time of year. I love the weather. I love every baseball game meaning something at the very end of the season. I love our disastrous, but we'll talk about that later, underdog picks in football every week. It's a great time of year. Well, we do have a fun, a fun packed show today. As you mentioned, we're going to preview the baseball playoffs. We've got our underdogs, underdogs, NFL picks, and uh, Ryder Cup is this weekend, and I'm going to share some some insights on on that. But let's start with baseball. Peter, we're in the final week of the regular season. There are still some playoff races going on, but but we are more concerned at this point about how to project who's going to take home the World Series trophy, and it is not easy. Jordan, I'm not sure it's at all possible. I mean, short series have a lot of randomness, variability, unpredictability in them. And what has the game of baseball done recently? It has added more short series to the postseason, even as fans of the very best teams seem to be even more demanding than ever that their teams somehow guarantee a win of the whole enchilada. These things do not go together in my mind. A lot of what we do here at this show is based around the uh, the concept we created with, with Giant Killers, now Bracket Breakers, for NCAA tournament upsets. We look at what's created upsets in the past in a certain situation, find sort of statistical harbingers, and then look at them and apply them to the current tournament. Well, we did that with the baseball playoffs. And I mean, Peter, take us through some of the categories we looked at and what happened when each time we looked at those those stats. Well, for a few years now, we've been just using the most basic, simplest method possible to examine the importance that various metrics and stats have to winning playoff series. Let's say the Red Sox are playing the Astros in a series. If the Red Sox hit more home runs during the season, not in the series, than the Astros and they beat the Astros, we count that as a win for home runs. Otherwise, we count it as a loss. Sure. And you can look at pitcher strikeouts, unearned runs allowed, runs scored, doubles, home runs, anything you can name. And every metric except one that we looked at ended up with a winning percentage under this formula of about 50%. In other words, pick a stat. If you're better at it than you're an opponent, you, you have basically a coin flips chance of winning a series against them. The one yeah. thing that sort of emerged from that group barely was yeah. OPS plus as a measure of offense. Um, the team with the better OPS plus, what, I think won about 56% of the series. Which Over is... the past three years, they won 56% of their uh series since the beginning of the two team two wild card team era they went about 60 between 60 65 percent of their playoff series that's not nothing it's not a lock but it's more than a lot of the other stats you'd think you know pitcher wins bunts whatever yeah and we'll get into what that means for the teams in 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 the current playoff field but to me that actually makes a certain amount of sense and and here's here's what i'm thinking People like to say, oh, well, you've got two aces, you'll do this. Or or th there are strategically a lot of different ways to get around pitching. You can, it, it, maybe you don't have Kurt Schilling and Randy Johnson, but maybe you have a really deep bullpen or five good starters and you can limit their innings so that they can go throw harder for shorter periods of time and piggyback each other. You Pitching strategy is one of the few things you can actually control as a manager in baseball. So you can get around lineups in different ways, mixing and matching. The Dodgers are probably gonna have to do some of that this year with their rotation kind of in shambles that you can engineer ways to shut down other offenses, whether it's using an opener, right? You, there's nothing you could do for, to compensate for a bad offense. You either yeah, hit uh, or you yeah. don't. And, and, and to elaborate on that, this is the time of year where a lot of fans want to see teams play small ball, move runners over, take, take extra bases, try to exploit the little things in the game. 
this is the time of year where it's probably the worst time of year to do that because here's the one thing we do know about the playoffs. There are no bad teams in the postseason, okay? You're not going to go from first to third as easily. You're not going to steal as many bases. The other team is not going to make as many errors. The one thing you cannot defend is hitting the ball out of the park, right? Now, there are ground ball pitchers and whatnot, but if teams that can actually mash are the teams that look like they're the hardest to stop. Because not only can you maneuver around pitching strategies, you can maneuver around small ball strategies. And I have one thing for you, Jordan. If you add up stolen bases, caught stealings, and sacrifice hits, right? Your kind of investment of outs in one run strategies. So stolen base attempts and bunts. The teams that did that the most often, the five teams that did that most often, they won 72.4 games on average this season. The teams that do that stuff are bad teams. Teams do not succeed by doing that stuff to get to the postseason or in the postseason. So this is the worst time of year to be squandering outs. And the best way to score without making an out is to hit a freaking home run. Home runs are the most efficient ways to score in baseball. That's what you want to do this time of year. But that's really frustrating for fans because they like to feel like there's some element of control especially that the manager has, right? So it's really hard for a fan in any sport to say, you know what, this is completely random. And, but in a, sh- in a series as short as baseball compared to the, no, no, no sport has the divergence between the length of the regular season versus the shortness of a series. It's a very different sport in the playoffs. And you could take three or five games at any point in the regular season and a hitter will go for 20. But in the playoffs, suddenly he's not clutch. And it leads to all these ridiculous false narratives about grit and managers, you know, pushing the right buttons and lineup construction and big game pitchers where most of it is just small sample size theater. And I know as a fan, that's really frustrating to say. And I know if you're a Dodgers fan, you want an explanation for for why your team has been amazing for only one world series. And you'd like to find some sort of fatal flaw in the way they're constructed, but honestly, really good teams lose in the playoffs it just happens and well you know, you know there's, there's two things about that is one is if what you're saying was not true there would be some key something you could focus on to improve your chances of winning but every time we look that's not the case last year houston led all of baseball in uh bullpen strikeouts st- strikeout percentage i thought that might be an indication of playoff clutchiness or winning turns out that's not true in previous seasons you and I talked about how maybe the ability to hit super fast fastballs, right? Yeah, that was my theory, was right? Was that like yeah. the pitching is supposedly that much better in the playoffs? Um, yes. How do teams do hitting against ninety-five mile an hour or greater fastballs? Is there, yeah. you know, maybe maybe the teams better designed to hit the hardest pitching do better in the playoffs? That well, did no, that that that, that turns out not to be. Last year, the Padres were twenty-eighth in weighted on base average against fastballs ninety-five miles an hour and over. And they beat the Dodgers, who yeah. were number one in baseball. The Phillies, who were 27th, they beat the Braves, who were number two. It's a, it's, it is very frustrating to come to the non-sexy conclusion. That there's not a, lime, not a lot of rhyme or reason to this. But let's face it, Jordan. Right now, we're in an era where the economics of baseball make it possible for there to be a four or five or six hundred win teams every season. We're in, we're in an era of multiple super great teams because the gap between the very best teams and the very worst has opened because smart teams are using analytics are not spending overspending on players, you know, like look at the Braves and you can have a Braves, a Dodgers, a Yankees and an Astros in the game all at the same time. You just can't predict which one of those teams is going to win in any given year. All right. So the question then becomes, we just talked about how you can't predict baseball, Susan. So what do you, what do you do in an environment like that? How do you bet on the playoffs? How, what do you do? And I think the answer is you look for the best value in each tier. So you've got four teams that will get buys in the first round that won't have to play the two out of three series. Okay. So of that, you've got Atlanta and the Dodgers and Baltimore and Texas. Well, Texas is plus 700 by comparison. Atlanta may be better than everyone, but they're just plus 310. And given how we have talked about random things happening, um, Texas has the second best OPS plus in baseball and they're plus 700 to me, you can get twice your bang for your buck on betting Texas, right? Doesn't that make sense? 
All right, let's not be nihilistic about this randomness. Let's take it to its logical conclusion and say if other people believe teams can win because of things that don't actually matter, bet against them by betting on a team that offers you better value. Texas does hit the hell out of the ball, and they're plus 700, and nobody can tell us why they should have any less of a chance to win the World Series than the Dodgers or the Braves, who, after all, are going to probably have to play each other before either one of them plays Texas to win the World Series. Right. Okay. So if if that's the so those those year, are the four right. those are the four top two division winner top right. seed they get a buy so they are kind of in a stratum by themselves when it comes to the betting lines below them is another tier of teams that are locks to be in but are going to have to play in that wild card round and so all of their betting odds take a hit but you can still find teams that hit really well and also teams of great value there right I mean look at the Rays Jordan yep the Rays the Rays have gone twenty five and thirteen. Since Wander Franco left the team, right. they are they finishing the season with the fourth best OPS plus in the major leagues. They're plus one thousand. I mean, yep. it, any year could be their year. This year could be their year. Right, I agree. And then there's that final tier of teams that haven't clinched a playoff spot yet that could be in or out. Obviously, you're going to get much longer odds to pick a, a World Series, a true underdog. There is there anyone before we before we wrap up this segment that you really like from that group? Jordan, let's go for it. Chicago Cubs plus 6,000 because they only have a half a 50 50 shot of even making the playoffs. But once they get in, they're as good as a bunch of teams that are going to be in those National League playoffs. They had a run differential of plus 101 as we talk. That's the best in the NL Central. They're third in the National League in runs. They've surrounded Cody Bellinger with a lineup of good hitters. And one other thing, you mentioned pitching depth before. Starting pitching depth matters less in the playoffs because you can concentrate your innings in your top three starters. The Cubs have Steele, Stroman, and Hendricks. Their four and five starters, Drew Smile and Jamison Tyone, combined to throw 280 innings worth of five ERA ball. You won't see them in the playoffs. So if the right. Cubs make it, they got a shot. Give them to me now, plus 6,000 for a lot of fun. Right. So that is, look, it's tough to embrace randomness, but we're saying do it. Find bets that you think have, have the biggest potential payoff for you, and then just sit back and let the chips fall where they may, because honestly, there's nothing you or anyone else can do to control much of what happens in the baseball playoffs. And that truly can, is baseball, Susan. That is. But what we can control is making better NFL picks, which we'll do right after this. All right. It's time for everyone's favorite segment during the football season, the underdogs, underdogs contest. And I'd like to think of this as a do-over week because... We could not have done worse collectively. Because we need a do-over? <laughs> okay. We lost all six of our picks. Oh. My two teams lost by a combined 84 points. <laughs> One of them gave up 70 points. <laughs> the closest anyone came, Sarah, you had the Bucks against the Eagles, who only lost by 14. Peter, you had the Falcons against the Lions, who only lost by 14. So we're just going to rewind. We've invited Sarah back again this week to to – turn this thing around because yeah, last week was terrible. So are you guys Jordan, ready? Jordan, may, may I ask, may I ask a quick question? Do you, th we've talked about the point in the season where you have to stop paying attention so much to signals from last year and start relying on data from this year. Do you think we failed to do that? And we stuck with signals from last season too much. And now we have to say, I mean, I have to say, for example, the bears just look completely disastrous. However much we expect to bounce back, they're disintegrating. They're not bouncing back. I'm not giving away my strategy. I will say that the consensus <laughs> among us and other you people. You can't give it away, Jordan. <laughs> all off season was that the, the two most improved teams were arguably the Broncos and the uh, Bears. And not only did they both lay massive eggs again last week, but now they're matching up as two 0-3 teams this week. So with that segue, Sarah, you have, the first, away, yeah. you have the first pick this week. The whole board is yours, <laughs> at least any team that's a three-point dog or, or or more. Um, So you know the rules of the contest. Let's get going. Yeah. Okay, well, <laughs> I feel like we embarrassed ourselves enough last week, but I was just – I was a little embarrassed that I picked Titans and then I saw – Jordan's pick. Thanks, Sarah. So it made, me, <laughs> made me feel better. Sorry. If you had the Broncos um, I'm gonna plus go with 49, you lost. Contest <laughs> contests are relative. You just have to be as usual. I've yeah. done minimal research on okay. this. All right. Um, well. I'm gonna go with this is gonna 
this is not going to go my way. But I'm going to go with the Arizona Cardinal 14 at the 49ers. I don't think they're going to win, but I think maybe they could they could cover. 14 is a lot of points. And I will say this was on my board. Also, the Cardinals are 3 and 0 against the spread, and they just beat the Cowboys. So they have something going they for them. They beat the Cowboys. That's that's what I'm also, do you know, Peter, you'll love this stat. The Cardinals are averaging 4.3 yards before contact per rushing play. They, just, they have a really possible? good run game. Yeah, they're, that... Maybe their offensive line's overperforming. And the Niners have only been, you know, teams aren't running on them that much because they're down early in games, but their advanced rushing defense statistics are not great. So I'm, I'm with you, Sarah. Cardinals plus 14, which brings it to me. And mm. I am going to take... The Panthers at home getting three and a half points from the Vikings. I think that hook is important. These are two 0 and 3 teams going against each other. Um, the Vikings are a mess. They, you know, they came back to the, one of the things we got right was that the regression monster was coming for them. So I could see this just being play out a lot of, similarly to the way the, the Chargers Vikings game played out, with, which is both teams making mistakes and trying to give the other team a chance to um, win. Uh, poor decision making, bad defense by the Vikings. So, given that scenario, I kind of like the way the the Panthers' offense looked last week. I'll feel better about this actually if Andy Dalton is playing quarterback and not Bryce Young. But um, I I think the three and a half is is just a bit too much. So, give me the Panthers at home getting three and a half against the Vikings. Peter, wow, you're up that, twice. That's, that's interesting because um, <clears throat> man, if Minnesota blows this one, that's big trouble, huh? Give me the Raiders plus six at the Chargers. Only um, 77% of bets are on <laughs> are on the Chargers, but only 31% of the money. The heavy money is has started with and stayed with the Raiders. And here's a way I like to figure out whether a team is better or worse than it's perceived. Road underdogs who are underdogs by less than a touchdown coming off a bad year in a team where the projected point total is going to be low. So you got a close game by a team that people don't think much of. That's, that's a short underdog on the road cover 59% of the time that describes the situation perfectly. I also think we're past the point of expecting regression to the mean with the chargers. We should expect ridiculous decisions, poor deployment of personnel and in a close game, those things can make a difference. Give me the Raiders plus six at the Chargers. All right. You got um, another one here. My second pick is the Texans plus three versus Pittsburgh. Um, I have an astounding stat, which is basically driving this pick. Calvin Austin had a 72-yard touchdown last week for the Steelers. Since 2015, there have been more than 277,000 offensive plays in the NFL, okay? That play ranks number one among them in expected points added. In other words, how well the play turned out versus how well it should have turned out given the situation and where the pass was and where the players were on the field. Number one in 277,000 plays, you could how, say- What does that mean? Like, why is it the most expected play ever? Uh, because he ran a deep route and multiple busted coverages on a throw that doesn't ever result in big gains and turn into a 72 yard touchdown. Pittsburgh's been lucky. Um, and again, while a majority of the bets have been on Pittsburgh, 67% of the big money, the total money actually is on the Texans. Uh, I think the Texans are a little bit better than they've seemed. Pittsburgh is considerably worse than they've seemed. Maybe there's a point or two of difference between these two teams. That's it. Give me Texans, the Texans uh, plus three. All right. Well, I am torn between two picks here. And I got to tell you, first of all, I actually think this was the, even though last week was the week we, we couldn't get a winner. I think this is the worst week for picking underdogs I've seen this season. There are a lot of favorites I actually like. So forcing ourselves into some of these picks is tough, but I've been going back and forth between whether I want to take the Falcons plus three but I'm, I'm going to pass on that. Do you know, guys, that since 2003, there have only been 12 times where two winless teams have met in week four or later? <laughs> and we've got two of them this week. So I already picked one of them. I went with the underdog in the Vikings and Panthers. 
Let's get crazy and do it again. I'm going no. with the Bears. No, no. Plus three at no. home against the Broncos. Here's here's what I'm banking on, okay? <laughs> the Bears have a lot of trouble protecting the quarterback. Um, but <laughs> the Broncos have the worst pressure rate in the entire NFL, which you might have been able to guess after the Dolphins put up 70 points on them. So I like the idea that Justin Fields, with actual time to throw, will take some deep shots to DJ Moore and company. I think he'll run more. I think the Broncos' defense is truly atrocious. I expect a shootout. This is a great game to target from a DFS perspective. Uh, picking either of these teams feels gross, but it's a gross kind of week. Give me the Bears plus three at home. Jordan, are you concerned at all that the Bears receivers aren't just not getting open because Justin Fields hasn't had time, but they actually have the dropsies? Did you see Chase Claypool last week? I mean, he couldn't catch a ball thrown right into his gut. It's it's kind of getting me worried that there are is. Are you no... asking me whether I feel good about this pick? No, but would I feel good about picking the Broncos either? No. So let's live dangerously. Sarah, take us home. Okay. I was debating between two also, but you know that I had to bring this up. So I'm taking the Jets plus 9.5 over or not not to win, but nine. against the Chiefs. Getting nine and a half. Uh, okay. Yeah. And and Here's my reasoning. Yeah. I mean, it's look incredible, but I think Taylor Swift fans, Swifties have sold out MetLife. I don't <laughs> think you can get a ticket to get in there because they think she's going to be there. The Jets are at home, so there's going to be a huge crowd. I think if Zach Wilson can, like, maybe, I don't know, play relatively decent, I think the Jets could come within 9.5. If Zach Wilson play, first of all, what's what's more likely that – Zach Wilson plays relatively decent or that Taylor Swift is at the game. Wow. That's a good one. Oh, Taylor and, Swift will come to New York. He's not going to be there. He's not going to be the game. chances. If you make that an extra, a bonus bet. I don't think Taylor's going to be at the game. Okay. <laughs> what do we want to bet? Wilson, well, we'll be at a, we be at a bet, should bet lunch at the Cornelia street cafe. What if Zach Wilson <laughs> plays really well? Do you think there's a chance that Taylor Swift ditches Travis Kelsey for Zach Wilson? <laughs> no shot. No shot. All right. Before we go on Friday, it is the start of the Ryder cup, which for me is about as good an event as exists in sports. It is golf of a different variety, two teams going head to head, the U S against Europe match play. It is stars on both sides and pressure. Unlike and talk to any golfer and they'll tell you the pressure of the Ryder cup is unlike anything they face in a regular tournament. So the thing about the Ryder cup is there's always this this sense that these these are these close finishes that it comes down to a final putt that the the score is you get a point for winning a match you if you if you tie a match it's called having it you get you get half a point um and that the, that these scores would come down to 14 and a half to 13 and a half or a 14 14 where the team retains the cup well in recent years that hasn't been the trend here are the scores of the last four Ryder Cups in, in 2021 the US won 19 to 9 in 2018, the Europe won 17 and a half to 10 and a half. 2016, the US won 17 to 11. 2014, Europe won 16 and a half to 11 and a half. Okay. Blowouts, each of all the last four Ryder Cups. So, how can you take advantage of that? The other interesting thing is the US hasn't won on European soil in 30 years, not since 1993 at the Belfry. And of the six world of the sucks yeah, of the six Ryder Cups played in Europe over that time, Europe has won by nine, seven, five, three, and then one point twice. So what does that tell you, Peter? Where, where is this? Where it tells me I'm looking for a home field. Ho I'm looking for a home field blowouts, Jordan. And and this year the the uh, Ryder Cups in uh, in Rome, right? Right. Yet even though this is in Rome, even though the 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 European team features Rory McIlroy, who's ranked second in the world, John Rahm, third in the world, Victor Hovland, fourth, Matt Fitzpatrick, eighth. The U.S. is a slight favorite. So if you want to bet on a side to win, you can simply take Europe. You can get them around plus 115, but we're looking for something bigger than that. So why not ride the blowout train one more time? Okay. At DraftKings, you can bet Europe to win by seven or more points at plus 700 or to win by four to six points at plus 550. I'm fine with either bet. 
I will be enjoying. I, I'm not sure I'll be waking up at 1.30 in the morning to watch some of the Ryder Cup, but it is a great inv- event. So, you know, between football games this weekend, if you can, you know, pop on some Ryder Cup, enjoy it. It's it's a It's a tournament unlike any other. <laughs>